All right. Welcome to episode 65 of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. We have Douglas Edwards. He's a philosopher at Utica College in New York State. He's the author of The Metaphysics of Truth, Properties, and the editor of Truth, a Contemporary Reader. His latest book is called Philosophy Smackdown. Welcome, Douglas. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thank you so much for coming on. So to begin, can you tell us a little bit about your background as a fan of professional wrestling and what is sort of your origin story in becoming a philosopher of pro wrestling? Yeah, so when I was a kid, I think probably about 11 or so, um, I grew up in a small village in the southeast of England and um, I didn't know anything about wrestling until one day I think my brother brought home a tape of, I don't know, I can't remember exactly, one of the early WrestleManias with Hulk Hogan in it. Um, from one of his friends who had it and like we watched it and we were just immediately kind of fascinated by it and obsessed so you know he would we I would always kind of you know get him to grab as many tapes as he could from his friends and we'd watch it we'd of course outside of our parents knowledge wrestle each other a lot <laughs> um, so we'd set up little you know we'd put like a duvet on the floor of a bedroom and set it up as a wrestling ring and you know, we'd kind of, you know, act out all the stuff from the shows and luckily didn't like seriously hurt each other at any point. But, um, but yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the duvet, I imagine like, you know, smack, you know, bringing somebody down like the, the rock, uh, which, which you call it? Uh, oh, the rock bottom. The rock bottom. <laughs> imagine that on a duvet. I'd be like, whoa. <laughs> we used to have them um, outside of my bedroom. There used to be like a ladder up to the attic. So we would use that <laughs> matches and, um, one time when we were moving house, we used like one of the cardboard like wardrobes as a casket for like a casket match. So we oh, that's did, so cool. <laughs> we did all that stuff and we like made belts and stuff. So we, we got super into it. And then um, as we got a bit older, we were started watching it more like the TV shows and stuff. So like the weekly like episodes of Raw and things like that. And we were quite lucky to be watching it in a time like a boom period for wrestling in the kind of mid the late 90s like the kind of attitude era time when, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock and all the kind of crazy stuff that was going on. Um, and then, yeah, so then, yeah, and then I started watching it more with my friend, uh, Chris, who uh, knew from school. And yeah, we used to watch it a lot, stay up in the middle of the night because a lot of the shows were on really late in the UK. So the pay-per-views, it'd be like from one to four in the morning on a Sunday night. <laughs> wow. We'd stay up and watch that and then go to school the next day, which was often like a bit of a disaster but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and then you know so um that was kind of like how I got into it was just you know I had no idea what it was and I definitely think like as I was getting older that it was a very gradual process of realizing like what it really was you know like and I think there was certainly a period of time when me and my brother engaged in like willful disbelief about or self-deception about it being real like we're trying to find you know because other kids would be like why are you watching that stuff it's it's like fake or it's you know it's pretend and we'd find ways of like trying to convince ourselves that they were wrong but obviously mm -hmm. the point when you couldn't do that anymore i mean uh it does take a lot of effort um to do a lot of the stunts that they're doing in the ring right i mean it's not like if you do that every night or almost every night it does take a toll on your body as far as that goes and what other sport is somebody putting themselves through that kind of rigor, right? Um, that's one. And then two, I mean, there, there are sometimes those real disputes that happen backstage or uh, something that happens that's a little out of character. Um, but in your article, I, I did notice that sometimes you, you, couldn't, you couldn't tell sometimes when something is a, is a play is, is, and when is it real, right? And I was wondering, um, how how did you connect philosophy uh to pro wrestling yeah so i think that that's something that happened pretty recently i was i think when i um because for a long time i when i started doing philosophy i kind of didn't really watch wrestling for quite a while and then um i started watching it again a few years ago when i moved to the us and um and i hadn't really thought that much about the two together and then um I think I'd, I got to a point where I wanted to, I'd just written a book about truth and I thought, well, I wanted to write something a bit different. And I was kind of thinking, well, it'd be nice to do something that, you know, was slightly 
like completely different, like not something that you'd normally find in an academic or at least a philosophy book. And I was at that point, I was just really into wrestling. I was listening to podcasts all the time. I was watching it a lot. And I just suddenly like, it was almost like a, like a eureka moment of like, oh, hang on a minute. Like there's all this stuff that would be really fun to think about, like reality, like freedom, you know, meaning all this stuff, like in connection with wrestling. Like, like you said, the stuff about the, you know, the, the reality behind like the appearance that you're presented with on the screen or in the ring. Um, and so it was really, I think it was, so then I just started to think about how to put that together into a book and thinking about exploring these things. But yeah, there wasn't, I think, uh, you know, obviously I've been interested in issues about reality and truth for a while. And it, I just, it, I just didn't realize for, for a long time that, it, that I could think about those in relation to wrestling. And then as soon as I started thinking about it, I really realized that I wanted to work more on it and write something on it. Um, and yeah, so, um, it was almost kind of by chance. <laughs> it was just like, it happened to be what I was really interested in at the time when I was looking for a new project. And then um, as soon as I thought about it, I was like, oh, that would be amazing to just like use all this like time that I've spent on, you know, what was really interesting to me and put it into something that was part of philosophy. And then in the book as well, I talk a bit about how I think philosophy as a discipline is a bit more like wrestling than maybe people. <laughs> people would like to think of it. <laughs> so that was yeah. next. And in your Aeon article, you wrote, pro wrestling fans are truth seekers, like philosophers, wanting to get behind the appearances and find out what their heroes and heroines are really like, what is really happening in the ring, which parts are scripted, which improvised, and which simply, and which simply the expression, which are simply the expressions of the wrestler's own personalities. So what you're getting at essentially is that in some way, and you connected it in the article, it's like we were like sort of Plato, right? Or at least sort of the kind of the person, the main person who kind of in the story of Plato's cave, who kind of came out and ended up seeing the truth and the light and uh, was actually sort of searching for it and then came out and then obviously ended up seeing the sun. And so what was the connection in your sort of understanding between pro wrestling and Plato's cave? Yeah, so I think I think you can kind of do like an analogy of so in the in the Plato's cave where you have the prisoners watching the shadows on the wall mm -hmm. uh, appearance, and then there's things like casting the shadows, which are the kind of like the puppeteers are kind of putting on the background, and then you have like the light outside the cave, which is like the ultimate thing. And I thought that in wrestling, there's like a similar three stage approach, right? So you have if you're, if you're watching a wrestling match, there's the action in the ring, which is like what's been presented to you, the appearance. Um, and it seems to you like you have two or more people, you know, fighting in a contest to win, to win the match. Um, and then you have like one level removed from that, which is the fact that that's not really what you're seeing. What you're seeing is two people working together to put on the appearance of a contest, um, which is kind of like the level two, like the, the puppeteers in the cave. Um, which is kind of one way of understanding what's going on or what you're seeing of explaining that. It's like, well, there's these people who are putting on this, this show. But then you have the kind of ultimate reality, which is another level of explanation, which explains why the people are putting on the show that, that you're seeing, which is the, you know, the backstage bookers, the writers, the, the promoters who, you know, have decided that these two characters are going to be wrestling for these reasons and the match is going to go this way and this particular person is going to win it. Um, so it's kind of like the appearance and then there's like the reality behind the appearance and then there's the kind of like, as I put it in the book, I think like the true reality behind all of that, which explains why everything is as you're seeing it is. And I think wrestling fans certainly, a lot of them really, you know, they enjoy the appearance, right? I think all wrestling fans enjoy the, you know, just being taken in by the show but then they also want to know more about the other stuff. They want to know more about the actual people involved and they want to know more about why the show has been written this way or like, you know, why the decisions been made to, to kind of have this character win or this sort of stuff as well. Um, so yeah, it was a similar kind of thought that just like philosophers, according to Plato, are like trying to get through appearances to, to understand what reality is really like. Wrestling fans are also trying to look through appearances to get to what, what the reality is like behind what they're seeing. And that is a level of fascination that I think almost for some wrestling fans is more intriguing than, 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 than just watching the shows. There's like, there's so many dimensions to being a wrestling fan, which I thought were really fascinating. And um, 
you know, kind of lined up in some ways with different ways of thinking about philosophy. That's right. And, and one uh, other perspective I've taken with wrestling is um, sort of a behavioral science perspective in the sense that when you see people rooting for uh, the heel or rooting for the baby face, right? And you see the whole crowd kind of uh, cheering and, 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 you, and you see, uh, for example, the dynamics that are at play when people like a heel, for instance, that's fascinating to me because you would think on the surface, oh, the heel is the bad guy. So why are all these people rooting for the bad guy? And then once you see, though, that this is, in fact, something that happens, um, it becomes very interesting to observe why it happens with, with people. Like, why, why, did, why are they interested in the bad guy? Mm -hmm. I mean, have you ever liked a heel before in wrestling? Yeah, I think we all have. And so what I was thinking of when Doug was talking was that essentially when it comes to the sort of um, the marketing of reality in some sense, right? It started with ECW. I mean, EC Extreme Championship Wrestling was the first. I think Paul Heyman, who was the, kind of the innovator there, said, you know, people want to see what's behind the scenes. People like want to know who these people are having relationships with behind the scenes. People want to know who actually hates whom. And they kind of want to know what the fans, or I'm sorry, what the wrestlers are like behind the scenes. So he created a company that essentially was so realistic that people actually thought they were seeing like real life, like, like altercations with people. Oh, wow. And so what was so interesting with Paul Heyman is, or actually with the wrestlers rather in ECW, there was this really great story of, I'm, I'm going to butcher it, so I don't remember it exactly, but there was this really great story of this wrestler, the Sandman. And so the Sandman, from my memory, was in a feud with Raven, I think it was at the time. And so Raven, I think, ended up blinding him. So in the, in the match, like he ended up like sparking some sort of match or whatever, and just like threw a fireball or something in his face. And so everybody's like, oh my God, the Sandman is blind. And true to character, the Sandman actually for an entire month did not come out of his apartment or wherever he was like living at the time. Because he didn't want anybody to see him. So people actually like bought into it. And they're like, like people in the neighborhood, like, hey, you know, we haven't seen this guy in like a long time. Oh my God, Raven really like hurt him. This is terrible. Raven's like a horrible person. But um, but so but to go back to your question, so yes, I have like the bad guy before. And I think for us is because when we see sort of um the sanitized character, we don't think of that as somebody who actually exists. Uh -huh. And um, this is a conversation that we had with who I think it was Mark White. So we had a conversation with him about Captain America, and so like why a lot of people some people like captain america and they sort of aspire to be him and then other people are like i don't know this guy's kind of full of shit and so i think the same thing happened with like types like hulk hogan you see this now with john cena where i think people just don't buy into it and so when they look at the heel they think this is what reality is more like they sort of identify more with the heel where they say like i'm more like stone cold steve austin than i am like hulk hogan i actually don't spend much time saying prayers eating vitamins but i spend a lot of time hating my boss and drinking beer <laughs> <laughs> Doug, what do you think? Why do you think people sort of gravitate toward the heel characters? I mean, I think, I think, yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. Like, I think, I think that time when when Stone Cold Steve Austin was kind of in the ascendancy, and you had the NWO and WCW and ECW as well. Like that time in the kind of later part of the '90s, where wrestling really was probably at its peak of popularity. And I think it was there because it seemed there was an injection of realism into it that hadn't been there before. Like. In the early 90s and the 80s, it was all very kind of cartoonish. Like, you, yeah, your 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 good guys, your baby faces were like your your classic kind of comic book heroes. In the yeah, the, the say your prayers, uh, drink your milk and eat your vitamins kind of stuff. Right, it was all very wholesome <laughs> to a large. Yeah. But you know that that only has a very limited sort of appeal, and especially as the audience that grew up watching wrestling in the 80s was getting older, and you've got now all these people who are teenagers that may have loved Hulk Hogan as a kid, but now it's like, come on, like I need something that I can relate to more. Like I'm a teenager going through adolescence, and I've got all this, you know, pent up aggression about authority and things like that. And then you've got all these kind of, yeah, these heels that were, you know, traditional heels and that they were pretty mean a lot of the time, but they also were very, anti-establishment and anti-authority and like ECW as a promotion that was its whole ethos was like everything about it was was trying to disrupt you know the regular order of things and with Austin and the NWA definitely like I mean the, the Austin Vince McMahon storyline where you know you had like this rebel against the authority figure I think anyone you know growing up whether it's your parents or your boss or your school teachers like everyone probably that was like everyone's fantasy to do what Austin was doing <laughs> to Vince in that storyline so I think it is that there did seem to be a le level of realism to it um and I think yeah I think it's somewhat 
I mean, it's, I think that the, the heels were, became more real. So they weren't like these kind of comic book villains either. Either that were just kind of inexplicably evil for no reason and just dastardly without any motivations. You know, we had people who, you kind of like got the point of why they were so angry and so upset. And I think, yeah, that, that did make them more relatable, more real. And then that, that leads to the situation then where it's kind of, you know, you're, where the, the traditional kind of baby face heel, good guy, bad guy dynamic got kind of disrupted. And it's a lot harder even now to really, there's a, the characters tend to be a lot more complex. I mean, you still have some that are straightforward heels, but there's not that many of them around that would just get universally booed. Um, yeah, and, so, well, and, and then so from the perspective of, I guess, um, like, I guess modern corporations or just modern work life in general, I think what made Stone Cold so appealing was that what you kind of saw from my memory of the storyline was that there was a sense of unfairness there. So if, I don't remember exactly how the feud began, but I do remember there being a pivotal moment where Vince said something like, you know what, this Vince McMahon wants Stone Cold Steve Austin to be the WWF champion? Hell no. And you know, the kind of fans bought into that because they're like, oh, that kind of feels like me. Like my boss doesn't... It doesn't feel like my boss wants me to succeed. It feels like there's a sort of unfairness oh, wow. in my company. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So what made Austin so cool was that like he was this guy who, so you know, like in wrestling, pretty much like you have like stables and you have like people trying to help each other. So at that time you had like Triple H and like he was always helping Shawn Michaels and DX. And then you had the Hart Foundation and Bret Hart like never won any of the matches fairly. Hardy but, boys. Yes, yes. And the, but then you have like this guy in Stone Cold who literally did everything by himself. So he came out and he's like, here I am with these like, you know, plain tights, you know, kind of my knee brace, my knee is fucked up and I'm just going to come out there and I'm going to do the best I can and I'm going to show you that I'm the best. So then it's like, you know, as he kind of goes up the ladder, you see like, oh shit, like this guy like doesn't need anybody. He's doing it as on his own. And then the boss comes in and the boss is like, oh, okay, I'll make you the champion, but you got to conform. And Austin's like, fuck you. Why would I have to conform? <laughs> like, this is a meritocracy. If I'm the best, I'm going to be the best. I want to be, I want to have the belt, right? That's kind of how it works. And Vince is like, oh no, it's my company. That's actually not how it works. You can't be the best in my company if I don't approve of it. Right. So I think the fans really bought into that because in their minds, they're like, yeah, you know what? America actually isn't much of a quote meritocracy. And it does feel like there's a lot of favoritism in my place of work. So when Stone Cold tells his boss, fuck you, that's how I feel. I want to tell my boss, fuck you, because I feel like, you know what? He's picking like these people over me when I probably work harder or I'm putting in more effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one thing as well with that, the popularity of Austin there is that one thing they didn't do when he started to get cheered because people identified with that was change him into like a more traditional, like heroic baby face kind of character. They kept him kind of the same. I mean, and I think that's another thing that was really crucial in like that whole development was that, you know, they could easily, which they'd done before when heels started to get cheered, just turn them baby face and then take away like all the heelish stuff from them, right. which sometimes people would lose interest in the character. Whereas with Austin, they, they stuck with him and just pushed that the exact same things that he'd been doing, but then it, you know, and relied on the crowd to just determine whether he was a baby face or a heel and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, because it's like he, he beat people up for good reasons. That's what I think people really liked about him was that whenever like with the scene where um, he had like manure in the office and then he was like pouring beer on it, people were like, yeah, no, 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 that piece of shit Vince McMahon really deserves that. <laughs> so it wasn't like it was like the traditional heel where like, you know, you would have villains who were constant, like the NWO, right? The NWO would just beat people up because they could and it sort of, you know, helped them gain sort of prestige and they made them feel good about themselves. Austin actually never gave anybody an ass whooping they didn't deserve. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's, I think, when they did turn in here, like, tried to turn in here eventually, you know, in 2001 after WrestleMania 17, when they tried to align him with Vince McMahon and turn in here, that's the, one of the first things they did was have him beat up people for no good reason. I hadn't really made that connection until you said that then, but that's like, that was, it was, wasn't just him beating up helpless people like Jim Ross or whoever it was. Right. Else, but it was that he was doing it for no good reason. Whereas before there had been some sort of, yeah, like, moral kind of compass that had been guiding him right in terms of who he targeted and then suddenly that was one way to make him someone that the crowd might boo is that take away that moral compass so the crowd can't identify with the reasons why he's doing this stuff anymore um yeah, yeah. and uh, why is it that you think that when things get uh too real when we know too much of what's going on behind the scenes that um the the viewer uh tends to have less interest in, in the storyline. Yeah. So I think I still kind of 
working through this. I mean, I did, the, the one reason I was thinking that was was because of what happened when a when co when a company did try to do that, right? So, in I think it was WCW in the in 2000 era, they were kind of struggling a bit, and they decided, well, look, we've got we know that fans are really into like the you know the newsletters, the dirt sheets, the the internet speculation, so let's put that in the show. So let's have a wrestler be unhappy about losing a match or let's kind of, you know, make it look as though someone's being told to lose. So they're kind of exposing the, you know, the, the backstage parts of it as part of the show. Um, and some of that was, did reflect genuine stuff, like, especially because, you know, Hulk Hogan was involved and he had creative control, which meant that he could have a say over whether he won or lost matches. And, you know, there were occasions when there were disagreements between him and the writers and, you know, so they're like, okay, well, let's, let's put this in the show. And I think, I'd, you know, from talking to other fans about it or, you know, from what I've heard listening to, to podcasts of people discussing this period, it seemed that one thing that turned people off was that, yeah, we enjoy the speculation, but we want something to speculate about, right? We want to see the appearance but, so that we can then speculate about the reality but if we're just given the reality then it's suddenly less interesting not just because it's less dramatic right because wrestling fans do want the actual regular show because they do enjoy suspending disbelief and you know certainly you know you you want to be taken in by it and if there's something that's kind of too real then it, it kind of takes you out of it and if it's sustained then you're kind of like well what am I watching now I don't really understand what this is anymore because there's no level of pretense there so my thought was well there needs to be some for the for the intrigue that, that hooks most wrestling fans in there has to be some something for you to speculate about uh, and if that's removed and you're just given the cold facts as it were on your screen then that's that's suddenly less interesting and, and it's not even it's unclear whether it's even pro wrestling anymore what you're seeing but it might just be that that was a company who just did it really badly <laughs> right that the wcw with vince russo's writing was just so badly done that um that you know it just turned people off now i mean but it's notable that still even now i think there's there's not really much i mean you get the occasional glimpse there's always there's always the tantalizing moments where you see something real like uh you know something real that a character's doing or that the person is doing rather than the character and that's great but if it becomes the whole show then it then i guess it, it, to me it starts to seem like something totally different if we're just if we're not given something to kind of hook us that we're then like oh well i wonder why that happened or who did um who did it that way so yeah, we need to be able to foster that sense of wonder in ourselves. If we're just given the answer, that's it's it's no longer fun, or it's not about fun necessarily. Necessarily, but maybe in, order to, in a in a way, uh, but it's like when we explore, right? Why do we explore? Or to go into a flow state, or mm -hmm. or or to to feel to try to quest for the answer, to be on the journey towards finding whatever the answer is. Mm -hmm. That's that's also fulfilling being told the nature of reality and this is how things work and all that it's not the same thing as finding out what that means for you uh, not, not that there is an objective reality but um sometimes when people come to these eureka moments or uh find within themselves some sort of um uh, or, or they, they kind of find uh, what their relationship is to the world, for instance. Like, for example, when I first um, learned about uh, being present to the moment, right? That, the, you know, the, not to uh, wonder about the past, not to be anxious of the future, to realize that what's going on currently, that's fundamentally, that's what's uh, happening right now. That's the reality, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you come to that, there are all sorts of feelings and, and uh, senses of uh, like, like you just came to something like you understood something. If I was just told that um, I'd be like, oh, OK, uh, you know, thank you for the knowledge. But I wouldn't necessarily feel as if it's true. Right. Something like that. Yeah. And I think that's you find a similar thing in philosophy as well. I think that's what you something you're trying to cultivate when doing philosophy or especially like when teaching philosophy to people for the first time is like, it is about trying to come to an answer 
like finding something out, but the process is really what you're trying to instill. Like I think the word wonder, as you mentioned, is a is a great point. It's it's about appreciating and like the you know the challenge. It's about like having curiosity and a sufficient amount of kind of wonder to just be like, okay, like I want to take some time and think about this. It's not maybe not as obvious as I thought it was, and it will take some time. And that process of thinking about things is kind of just as much the goal as the as the answer, especially in philosophy where, you know, the answers are somewhat always contestable. Um, and I think, yeah, you could say a similar thing about wrestling. It's like you, people want the fascination. They want the wonder. They don't want, yeah, if you're just given, if you're just given the answer straight up without any sort of, any sort of material for you to kind of in, in, involve yourself in the process as well, then I think it becomes less interesting. It becomes less personal, I think. You know, I think that's another way of thinking of it is we want to involve ourselves in it. Um, and if we're not given that opportunity, then it's, it's less interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's like, okay, this is a simplistic example. But uh, so I, I wasn't watching wrestling necessarily during this period. Uh, I have a friend who does. Um, and so there was this very popular character, CM Punk. Yeah. Right. And uh, I, you know, I didn't even watch wrestling, but I knew who this guy was because it, it, every time that he was on the TV, he was so enthralling and, and engaging. Uh, and it always seemed like whatever was happening with him, between him and management uh, seemed real. It, like there were even articles, I think, that came out uh, as as if uh, he really was going off script or something like that. Um, and my example is this, for, for instance, when he left, a lot of people were speculating, would he come back or, or anything like that? Um, and that, that's a big thing for fans. Um, however, uh, the mystery of that was kind of taken away. I believe he actually said like, no, 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 for real, I will not be returning. And also, uh, I think uh, management at WWE as well said they wouldn't be taking him back and all that. But it would have been interesting if they let us wonder if he would ever come back. Because every time I would then watch the show with my friend, if there was a big pop or you're wondering who is going to come out right now, I'd be like, CM Punk, it always, for some reason, right? Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be him, but that was always fun to, you know, yeah. play around with that. And I mean, I, and I also just add on to that. I mean, I think that like human beings in general, we feel like we, I think we're all natural explorers. And for us, we want to be the ones who make discoveries. Like, like what Doug said, it being personal. Because I can tell you, man, the reason why, one of the main reasons why I got into psychology is an ego, it's sort of an egotistical reason is because it's interesting to me, right? Because there are certain truths about the psyche that like most people don't know. And it's like, unless you actually sort of read the text about it, if you explore it with people, right? You're never going to know it outside of like what people tell you on the surface. So what's so interesting i think about wrestling and digging into it it's like you're you you're the one who makes that discovery you're the one who has that aha moment and you could say oh well i found like this really great newsletter that maybe not many people know about and i've read about this thing that like maybe few people know about and then it's like you can kind of make predictions and you could say oh so Doug, i remember i'm sure you remember this remember back in like the early 2000s there were like these spoilers that were on like these really really like sketchy websites and it's like if you wanted to know what happened on like or oh, what was like the plan for raw or the plan for smackdown you could read about it and you could say behind the scenes it's like linda mcmahon is talking about like bringing in the nwo or whatever and everybody would talk about it, it was like oh my god i just read this on like this god knows what website that like linda mcmahon is bringing in the nwo or whatever and i remember the websites were so sketchy that there was one time where a friend of mine calls me and he says oh dude so like you, i gotta read you the smackdown spoilers and i'm like okay what what happened and so he's like yo this is like the craziest thing probably ever so he's reading it to me right he's like so vince mcmahon is sitting on the chair and then vince mcmahon starts talking about poison and then vince mcmahon says he's bringing in the nwo and i talk to him and i'm like dude shut the fuck up and he's like no seriously yo the nwo is coming and i'm like no and i'm like what stupid website did you get that from there's no way that that's true and he's like no dude i'm really not fucking with you the nwo is coming i'm like sure right vince is bringing in the nwo okay right and i'm like and you know me i'm like oh i'm like too smart for this shit i'm never gonna fall for that garbage and literally that night like because it was a spoiler from the day before uh -huh. that night he brings in the nwo and i call him like yo the nwo is coming and he's like yeah no shit <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's like a lot of times with these websites, you didn't know whether to trust them or not. So it's like, cause a lot of the times they weren't spot on. And it was like, um, it was like the equivalent of like, I don't know if people magazine is the right term, like the national Enquirer or whatever. So it's like, if you read one of these websites, it was if websites, it was literally reading the national Enquirer. So like maybe 20% of the time they were right. Most of the time they weren't, but what made it so cool is that if you can kind of point to it and say, Oh, see, I knew it. I read it on that website. And I was the smart one to say like, that's actually true. I kind of put the pieces together and I was like, no, 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 the end of you actually is coming. <laughs> it's kind of interesting as well, because like, there's a, almost like a conflict because there's that like reason for intrigue of like wanting to know and wanting to be the first to know, wanting to find out for yourself. But then that kind of conflicts to some extent with like the enjoyment of the actual show, right? So if you, if you hadn't known anything about the NWO and just watch the show and then you see that scene where, you know, Vince turns around and you see NWO on the chair, like that's like a real like, holy shit moment, right? Because you yeah. really surprised to think about like a, a, a return or a debut of a wrestler that you wouldn't have known about if you hadn't read about it on a spoiler site. And it's kind of like, so sometimes I find, well, you know, especially, I found myself sometimes, because I'm really like, yeah, I want to know all this stuff. But then if it's a show I'm really interested in, I might just screen myself off for a couple of weeks beforehand so that I don't get any spoilers for it. But it's, it's kind of hard to do that. Um, like when, um, I think it was last year when AEW's first pay-per-view, Double or Nothing, which is the one that John Moxley debuted at. And I remember thinking like, there's rumors about this, but I just don't, I just, I want to watch it and I don't want to know if it's likely to happen or not. And then when it happened, it was an incredible moment. But even so, I think the crowd in attendance, the pop for that was enormous. And I think a lot of people probably knew it was coming. So maybe it doesn't conflict that much, but it's, it's certainly interesting. Like, you know, sometimes you have to make these choices between like which of these things you value about. about yeah. But I got to say though, because I remember like as a kid when, um, so like, you know, when we started reading the websites, we were teenagers already at the time, but I started res- watching wrestling, I think like eight, nine years old, something like that. And I got to say, man, I think for when I was a kid, it was much more interesting because you actually didn't have these websites. At least, you know, I didn't because I'm like a kid. What do I know? I don't know how to access a website. Um, so it's, well, at least I didn't back then. I'm sure plenty of kids know how to use like iPads or whatnot now. But the point was that when I was like eight, nine years old, I remember when things like, were like really crazy and unexpected things happened. Like we were like absolutely floored. And the one memory that sticks like, or that pops up to mind is the Rick Root, the Rick Root sort of double appearance. So with, so for Alan, I know that he might not know about this. So Rick Root was this dude who was like, he was the manager of Degeneration X at the time, right? Mm-hmm. So they lost Bret Hart because like Vince McMahon screwed him over. I'm sure you remember the Montreal screw job, right? Yeah. Yeah. The show. <laughs> so whatever. Like, <laughs> so point was that like, you know, um, so Shawn Michaels wasn't supposed to win the match, but then Vince came out and he had the referee ring the bell. And then that was the way Bret Hart had his exit and went to WCW. So they had like, I don't remember exactly the day this was. It was probably sometime in December. So Rick Rude, who was the manager of DX, right? So because Raw was taped, they already did the show with Rick Rude at that time, right? So at the exact same time that the Raw taping was going on, Rick Rude somehow was on the live version of Nitro and his beard was gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so wow. he shaves his beard and he he comes out to the NWO music and then it's like you're like wait what the fuck is going on and you're flipping back and forth because you're like wait I don't at, at the time we didn't know what was live and I was like wait I don't where is Rick Rude is he on Raw is he on Nitro and then so like as you're kind of flipping through trying to figure out what's going on on Raw he's just talking about like some you know wrestling storyline or whatever he's like oh you know like DX is like you know the best or whatever we're gonna sort of you know we're gonna regain our belts or whatever it was right something something just Monday but then when you go to Nitro he's like yeah man he's like I I don't ever want to work with Shawn Michaels and Triple H again. He's like, I can't stand Vince oh, McMahon. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, wow. they screwed over Bret Hart and I'll never forgive them for that. And he just went into this whole big rant and Eric Bischoff is standing behind him like doing like this and laughing because, you know, they're making a ton of money off of this. And so like, and you're just floored by it. You're like, holy shit, this guy like actually in real life turned his back on this company. So I don't know how it worked out contractually, but he was literally like supposed to have been a WWE contracted wrestler or whatever manager. And at that time he was actually on Nitro taking a big shit on all of them and he's like i stand with like bret hart and he's like this is a disgrace to professional wrestling and the reason why i'm here is because i would never stand for something like that and then there he is on raw talking about some garbage about oh well like Shawn michaels is gonna face this guy next week and we have his back or whatever it is but like in reality he's like yeah i'm never going back there again so that was probably one of the craziest moments that i remember as a kid I remember Rikishi giving the stink, I forgot what it's called, the stink face, I think, right? To yeah. Man. 
like moments like that or uh trish stratus and uh triple h being caught back scene uh, in the back background oh yeah, yeah. Uh, um what's her name stephanie mcclellan yeah, yeah, yeah there you go yeah, so it's like there were scenes that seemed real, but then there were like these really authentic moments with Rick Rude. So, or like with people, but Rick Rude was one of them. Doug, do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I remember the, the yeah, the Montreal Screwjob stuff at a time around that time really well because I think that was like one of the points where you know where I was watching it with my brother and he was like I was a huge Bret Hart fan and he as a result you know would would support whoever Bret Hart was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when that happened like at the end of the match when so yeah when when Vince McMahon ordered the bell to be rung when Bret Hart was caught in the sharp shoes that Shawn Michaels was giving him and um like my brother was like haha he submitted like he gave up and I was like no like that just, and I can't remember at the time like I think it was both me feeling like there's no way that like that would ever happen in a match like Bret Hart would never submit but also like there's no way that they would book that in Canada at that point in that storyline. So it just can't be that that's, that will happen. But then like the screen faded to black and then it was just kind of like, oh. And I think that was one of the moments when I started to like really dig around more for like, cause I really was kind of like, what the hell just happened? Like, and I didn't want to believe that it was just like a normal, like, oh, he just gave up and he lost the title. Cause that was so out of character for the, the Bret Hart who was like my hero. Cause even though, he was a heel as presented on the US shows. You know, we were in the UK and it was presented to the worldwide audience as a as still a baby face. So um so then yeah, I remember the all the kind of subsequent fallout with um with Rick Rude. I didn't was we didn't used to be able to watch the shows live because they didn't show them live in the UK, but that we we'd get them on a Friday. So um and I don't think we had Nitro then. We got it later. Mm. So I don't think I was able to watch the I didn't get like the two things live, but I remember finding out about it and just being like, yeah, I mean, so yeah, I think that that those kinds of bits of like, yeah, where you get, and the Rick Reed thing is a fascinating contrast, as you mentioned, between you've got like a, a regular kind of promo on the WWF channel and then a kind of shoot one on the, a real one on the WCW one. You're getting two different, the two different sides <laughs> of the appearance reality, like, divide <laughs> on two different shows at the same side they're both pro wrestling shows it's kind of yeah that's yeah real kind of yeah. and so what was so cool i remember was that it, during i think the 1996 um season or whatever you'd want to call it for wrestling so they started filming bret hart's wrestling with shadows documentary mm -hmm. and what was so yeah you remember that right so what was so cool about it was that this was just supposed to be like just an average documentary on bret hart's like you know kind of career right and then so what happened in sort of the filming of it right is it actually got to the screw job and so like this these people who filmed this documentary hit gold so like there are plenty of wrestling documentaries that are like sort of behind the scenes and they're nothing special but because this actually caught him at this time like it, be, it just blew up this documentary so what was so cool about it is i remember they show him like in a pool in 1996 and this is what i think i mean this is going to preface this by saying this is my opinion but this is what made vince look like such a fucking piece of shit oh, wow. so yeah so bret hart is like in a pool right so it's like i think the end of 95 i think it's about to be or it's either 1996 it's the beginning of 96 or the end of 95 right so he's in the pool he's talking to his wife and his wife is like oh so like you know like ted offered you this pretty crazy contract like you know we maybe should like consider it Brett's like no we're not going to do that he's like look i know you know we could use the money or whatnot but he's like but my loyalty is to vince and literally he's in the pool swimming with his kids he's like my loyalties to Vince. He's like, I'm re-offing. He's like, we're signing another deal with him. So wow. it goes on, right? And then he goes into the sort of the room, right? And from my vague memory of it, Vince was like, wow, Brett, like, thank you so much. You know, I appreciate your loyalty. He's like, I know we can't pay you what like Ted's going to give you, but he's like, we're really grateful for you taking the deal. Brett's like, yeah, no problem, man. He's like, Vince, I'm with you. He's like, you're, you're my guy, right? So he comes out and then the camera guy's like, oh, so like, how did you, how did you feel about the meeting? He's like, it's good. He's like, I let Vince know that my loyalty is with him. He's like, look, he's like, I'm appreciative of WCW. That's not for me. I'm never going to go there literally then you rewind the documentary like 30 40 minutes later whatever it is if it's fucking screws him and brett's going to wcw after all of that yeah yeah oh wow. yeah yeah 
that sounded so honorable and right. so nice for right. a moment. I said, oh yeah, my loyalties lie with Vince. Yeah. Vince sounds like he's amicable as well. Yeah, and yeah. Amiable, yeah. And then it's like somewhere in the middle of the documentary, I remember they were saying that Vince was like, oh, like, you know, once they started talking about it, Vince like, look, we can't like even keep you under your current contract now. He's like, we're like losing money or whatever it is. He's like, we have to pay like Sean, Taker, or whatever. He's like, you should take the WCW deal. So Brett's like, okay, I mean, I don't want to go to WCW, but I guess, I mean, if you're not really going to even be able to offer me what I was making before, fine. But then like after all of that, and then he still screws him. Like, just let him go. Let the fucking guy go. Don't like screw him out of the belt and make him look like an asshole in front of his own crowd. So yeah. that was like, yeah, tough moment. Yeah. You know, I think, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, I mean, I think he was, you know, it really, you know, I don't think Bret Hart ever really recovered from that, you know, in terms of like his, his character, at least in WCW was never really, didn't really take off. I think that that really scarred him, that experience. You know? um, yeah, and it's yeah. like, he, he didn't want to go there. That was the other thing. He never wanted to go there. So, I mean, it's like, what do you kind of do at that point if the guy isn't going to pay you whatever? So it's like, Brett was already a main eventer and he was just like, just pay me what you were paying me last year. And Vince is like, no, we can't do it. He's like, we can't afford you. So, I mean, I guess, what do you do at that point? And as audience members at the time, did you guys notice that he wasn't enjoying himself or something on WCW or was he just being... Doug, can you tell us your memory? But yeah, the answer, the quick answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, I can't remember if we were really watching, if we really had much WCW at the time, we probably, I don't remember watching that much of him because it wasn't as easily available, but the bits that I remember seeing, it just wasn't. Like his, you know, there's just all the parts of the presentation that you think would seem fairly, like wouldn't matter that much, but even the fact that like, he didn't have the music that he had, like there was so central to his character. He didn't have the same. It, also as well, like the fact that, you know, he'd been in, on, in the WWF with all of his, like his family members in the Hart Foundation, like Owen Hart, the British Bulldog, Jim Neidhart, and, and the, the kind of family friend of so Brian Pillman. And then obviously they, you know, he's now he's in WCW kind of on his own. I think they did bring Bulldog and Neidhart in, but it just wasn't the same, you know, it just felt, it felt like there was no continuity. Of, it was hard to know like where his character was going to go. And I don't think they really planned out what they were going to do with him. So he, he ended up kind of just, one thing that was really odd was they just kept turning him like face and heel all the time. So he like joined the NWO, which made no sense. And you're just kind of like, what's going on? So it, it, there was never a point where he seemed like the same character even as what he'd been in the WWF because he was, and then obviously, you know, when Owen Hart died not long after, I think that really, you know, he never really recovered from that either, obviously. So, um, but yeah, so I think, yeah, it was, uh, but then on the flip side of that, right? So this destroyed Brett, but then Vince McMahon turns this into like his evil mm -hmm. character, Mr. McMahon, and he become and they go on to have like, you know, the most successful run that they ever had because he's the foil for the Stone Cold character. So Vince turned the reality of him screwing Brett into a, into a character, which became this incredibly successful thing for the WWF. So it's, you know, looking at the trajectories of the people involved, it's, Kind of awful that you know the dastardly person <laughs> ends up you know profiting enormously from this whereas the person who you know on the face of it seems to be wronged kind of really suffered or you know people debate endlessly about you know who was in the right in this situation like you know the, the company folks from wwe will tell you that well like vince had to do this because he couldn't let brett go to wcw as the champion he had to have him lose Brett refused to lose and he was able to refuse because he had creative control in his contract at that point. So Vince had to do it. Like he, he had to protect the company. So that's what people will say. But um, I don't know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I I mean, <laughs> and, and Brett's argument was that he was going to come back and drop the belt the night after. And I'm pretty sure knowing who he is. And again, going back to that documentary, I mean, he's a stand up guy. My thinking is, look, I get the argument on the other side and that Vince definitely had to protect the company, but I also think you need to know the people involved. And so if you look at Brett's history, I mean, he was never like, nobody ever sort of bad mouthed him or at least anything that ever made sense. Um, and nobody ever sort of painted him in a light where you saw that this person was just like a dishonorable human being. So for Brett, I think he would have actually done it. I think he would have came the next night in Nitro, he would have dropped it and he would have said his goodbyes. So obviously Vince didn't want to take the chance. That part I understand, but you know what? But then Vince could have manned up about it and said, you know what, Brett, I, we're, 
we don't want to take the chance. It's nothing personal. Like I, I get it that you've been honorable and loyal and I, you know, I want you to do well and succeed in WCW. At the very least, he could have said something like, you know, maybe let's not have the match or let's do something else instead, but let's have you like drop the belt that night at Survivor Series and you'll kind of have your farewell match against Sean without the belt or whatever it is. He could have thought of it, but he didn't even like include him in that. And I, that one I never understood. One thing I never really got is like, why didn't they just do the screw job angle as an angle? Like, why didn't Brett, look, I'm going to screw you out of the title. You'll come out as the hero. You'll go out into the sunset being wronged. I'll come off as the bad guy. And then, like, you know, that gives us both a place to go from here. <laughs> the only idea there was maybe the cons- I mean, I know there had been screw jobs before, but I just thinking about it, it's like, why wouldn't that just be a story? You know, you can, then everyone seems to come out of it okay. I mean, you can do the screw job in the show, so it's not like revealing the backstage stuff, right? You can have Vince come out and just force the referee to ring the bell or something because he's the person in charge and he can do what he wants. Yeah. So, I don't know. That, that's something. And I know some people do speculate that this whole thing was a part of the story anyway, and I guess that's... Right. <laughs> that's fascinating that uh, we... It makes you wonder what's true and what's not, right? Uh, tying back to your to your article, it's it's fascinating. It's like uh, this this uh, makes the audience essentially into philosophers trying to seek what is true, right? right? Yeah. And trying to use their sort of critical thinking skills, which is what I was saying earlier with the websites. Like well, we used to kind of piece together information and sort of think about it critically. And we would think, okay, so this website is right maybe like 30% of the time, right? So there's a 30% chance that this sort of storyline is going to happen. And then, oh, this website is completely full of shit. So there's no chance that this is right or very minimal chance that this is right. So we would be like these little sort of detectives, honestly. And I kind of like that way of seeing it. We were philosophers in some sense. So with, through our detective work, well, we, oh, so, and here's the thing, man. In our kind of like circle, if you ever told anybody anything that wasn't true, that didn't come to fruition, you were actually like kind of disrespected and you were looked at like, oh, don't, don't take anything he says seriously. Wow. So for us, the investigative work had to actually be pristine. So if you came and you said like, oh, um, what I think is going to happen and sold out is that like Sting is going to drop the title to Hogan and whatever, for whatever reason, and this is what's going to happen. And if that didn't happen, you would get ragged on in school and people would be like, oh, see, you're like a moron, man. You have no idea what the hell is going on. So we were like pristine about what we said it was sort of like philosophy it's sort of like getting published right you have to be really careful about the sort of ideas you put out because if you put out the wrong idea right then nobody's going to take you seriously anymore so in some sense we were kind of like our own detectives trying to figure out like which information to sort of take in and which information to disavow and then sometimes even which information to present with sort of um with a grain of salt and then to say like i have like a hunch that this might happen or some part of this but don't take it too seriously because i'm not exactly sure but we had people man who would like buy into every rumor and they would come to be like oh dude let me tell you what's gonna happen on nitro like oh this fucking guy again (laughs) there's a term for that right if somebody knows what they're talking about they're a mark a mark yeah if they don't it's something else right or they're all marks no is there another term for like an expert what would we call no no somebody who is not an expert someone who makes the wrong oh that's a mark somebody no a mark is somebody who makes like the wrong predictions oh yeah Yeah. is that right it was a mark then (laughs) (laughs) sometimes you get like a mark as being someone, as describing someone who's like, doesn't know that it's not real or something like that. So like a, a kind of something like that. And then, then there's like a smart mark or a smark who's someone who's like a smart fan who's someone who knows. So smart fan is someone who knows that it's real, but then mark, it's like, well, even though you know it's real, you still like get sucked into the show and kind of like cheer and boo or mark out as I think the time is. <laughs> The way that someone who wouldn't know that it was real kind of like um, does. <laughs> but I think Mark in general, that I think that term does refer to someone who's like kind of gullible. So I think it does yeah. apply in this case as well. So I think it comes from the time when wrestling was presented as, you know, in the kind of carnival context as like a kind of con, right, to try to get people to. Um, so I think at least one of the origins was in, in car- traveling carnivals, they would kind of have like a strong man or a wrestler who would, you know, challenge anyone in the audience to a fight and if they won the fight they, they could win so they would pay, pay a certain amount of money and then they if they lasted a certain amount of time they would win a prize and then they would have a plant in the audience who would who would be another wrestler who would come in and you know do a really who, who would do a really good job and make it look like the strong man was not very good and then they would kind of open it out and then then you know some average 
you know, person in the crowd would be like, oh, hey, I could beat this guy. And then they would go in and get, <laughs> and lose. And, and that way they could make money off, um, you know, some, some people attending carnivals. So I think, and then that, as that became, you know, wrestling in the early days, especially was very closed in terms of its community. And like, so you really wanted all of your fans to be kind of marks in this way, because you wanted them to think that it was real. So they would pay money. And then I think, yeah, as we got to the, the 90s and things like that, uh, and probably before that, I'm sure, you know, then then there's like these other layers of wrestling fandom where, you, of course, people know that it's not kind of a real contest, but that doesn't diminish the enjoyment of it or people's willingness to spend money to watch it, which I guess is what the, the companies are really interested in. Um, and I think like the stuff with this backstage stuff and another thing that the Montreal Screwjob kind of showed was just how fascinated people are by that and how willing they are to to spend money on it you know i think when you look at the popularity of um you know the, the newsletters and and things like that and and wrestling companies knew that so then you get these kind of what's called like work shoots which are you know moments in the show that are presented to be real and not part of the show <laughs> but that are actually kind of put on so like the cm punk stuff that we were talking about earlier you know, there's some dispute about a lot of that, which seemed really real, especially that his, his kind of pipe bomb promo where it's the, he was saying all this derogatory stuff about Vince McMahon and the WWE and stuff, and then they cut out his microphone. It looked like he was shooting, he was doing a shoot interview. Um, but then the question's like, was that, but then was that just worked as, you know, presented as part of the show, even though it was, seemed real? Because then, then you get that fascination and that intrigue and then all these speculations about when is CM Punk coming back? People buying pay-per-views. Because, hey, this one's in Chicago, and CM Punk lives in Chicago, so maybe he's going to come back at this one. And it's like, you can, you can then run that for quite a while. I still think he may come back. But that, see, I'm, I'm one of those people. I'm a mark, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's like everybody, it seems like they want to be in the know. And by the way, I think, um, Doug, from reading your article on Aeon, I think, and again, this is sort of my interpretation of it. Um, it's just, I think when, uh, so just going back to the event itself, right? So like one of the worst events in professional wrestling history was WCW Bash at the Beach 2000. So for you guys that don't know about it, what happened in this storyline was that Hulk Hogan essentially was supposed to fight, or Hollywood Hogan at the time. He was supposed to fight Jeff Jarrett for the WCW title and then what happened was because of some backstage dispute between Hogan and Russo Jeff Jarrett actually like ended up lying down and then Hogan like put his foot on him and then he won the belt in like seconds and so then Vince like comes and he throws the belt into the ring and he's like here you can have it I don't give a shit about the stupid title and then he walks away Hogan picks up the microphone and he's like that's why the, this is the reason why this company's in the shape that this is that it's in and it's garbage or whatever and like that was the last time you saw Hogan in WCW so like it seemed like you know like a real storyline obviously seem really great but from my interpretation what made it so silly or what made it sort of counterproductive was what we and again this is going back to your article and my interpretation of it is that we want to feel like we're sort of in the know where it's like not everybody's in the know but we're in the know so like when we go digging for information and like let's say i don't know, we present it to people like on a podcast or we present it in the newsletter we want to sort of be kind of like prophets in some sense right we want to be like oh hey guess what i know right now you guys are going to want to kind of give me attention and take me seriously Whereas if you see something like that on a pay-per-view, you're like, yeah, who cares? Everybody knows this. What's the big deal? And I think it's very similar to what people do or what philosophers do too, right? They want to sort of be the, the kind of seers, right? Who are able to sort of see into, um, into sort of the deeper aspects of reality and to say like, hey, we've sort of went into the let's say what you would call it. Um, we kind of went into the abyss, so to speak, right? And then we've kind of come back with all of this great information and we've given it to you in a way that's easily understood. And I think that's what a lot of wrestling fans are looking for too. They want to be those people. They want to be those like Dave Metzger's or, um, or even Vince Russo at this point who has his own podcast and there's like a bunch of behind the scenes stuff too. And I think that what WCW did was it essentially took that away from people. It's sort of like the idea of like, well, if everybody has it, it's not really that valuable. Mm -hmm. Or if everybody knows that it, it's not really that valuable yeah i think that's right i think that's a great way to put it you want to you want to have like little nods to the knowing fans like easter eggs for people to like be like oh i get that but not everyone will but if it's all just laid out for everyone then yeah i think the point is yeah the, the, the analogy there yeah it's like something that everyone has and then it ceases to become interesting <laughs> in the same way yeah and you know, what's also really interesting, and I mean, I know this is a little bit off topic, but the sort of labor history of professional wrestling. So um, there was this really good article. I don't remember the author's name, but it was in Jacobin magazine about 
it was called Money in the Bank. And it was essentially about how like professional wrestling is the epitome or I guess a great example rather, or whatever, I guess that's the same thing, the epitome of American capitalism. And so what they found is that the labor history of professional wrestling has actually been pretty awful. And so going back to the carnival days, I mean, essentially like these people would get ripped off consistently. And then as you kind of go back or not, well, I guess go forward, but for us go back, as you go into like the eighties, only guys like Hulk Hogan and like Randy Savage, Andre the Giant at the time, these were the only people who were actually making like substantial money. Like they were making good livings. A lot of these other people actually had like secondary jobs on the side. They didn't have health care. Uh, Vince wasn't paying into social security or any sort of unemployment at the time. There was even a really great story about Bret Hart getting injured. And from my vague memory, I think it was 1992. And so he was actually rushed back because he, um, so Vince was only paying him, I think a couple hundred dollars a week at the time. And he was rushed back because he needed to pay the bills and he needed to take care of his family. And Vince wasn't even paying for his health insurance at the time. Yeah. So really crazy story. So as you kind of go back and you know, again, going forward, you're looking at sort of how like, um, how sort of organizing became prominent in professional wrestling and how sort of these guys, when obviously now the female wrestlers too, how they, when they get together as like they created a more fair environment, because back then, especially in the territory days, these owners were just doing whatever the hell they wanted to. And what they did was they had pretty much these trusts where um, like, obviously, even though they had like seemingly different territories and companies, they would actually blackball wrestlers. So it's like, if you had some sort of financial dispute with one of these like promoters, what would happen is that you try to go to some other territory and those other guys are like, no, 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 I know about this guy. We don't want you here either. Because if you're going to start a ruckus with our guys backstage, we'd rather, we don't care how much of a draw you are. We'd rather not have you here. Hmm. So it's also kind of interesting to view it in terms of labor and in terms of kind of like just unionizing and uh, workers' rights and sort of how far it's come as a whole as a business. Yeah. I mean, I think there's still issues with this whole idea of um, like wrestlers are classed as independent contractors a lot of the time. So like WWE will, you know, wrestlers will be under contract so they can't wrestle for anyone else, but they're not classed as employees, which means that they don't get health insurance and things like that automatically. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, if someone gets injured or sometimes they'll pay some of the bills, but you know, it's by no means guaranteed. And I think yeah, they're not allowed to go and work for anyone else if they're not being used or anything like that because they have these exclusivity deals. So you have people who are, who, you know, seem to be, by all intents and purposes, like what you class an employee to be. So you'd have to give them certain benefits. But yeah, they're, because they're in this different category of independent contractors, they are not able to get those things. So I think that, yeah, I think, yeah, it's definitely the, yeah, there's all sorts of things about. You think about yeah, the idea of a mark in terms of the audience um, and things like that, but it's also yeah important. The, yeah, the, the power relations between the promoters and the wrestlers is often yeah not not really where you'd want it to be. <laughs> and yeah, a lot of people, especially when they stop wrestling, you know, um, you know, end up being being rather lost and often broke because they just don't have any any place to fall back on, and they have all these. Um, health problems without any sort of insurance or anything like that so I mean there was that movie The Wrestler a few years ago with Mickey Rourke and I think that was <laughs> intended to be a fairly accurate representation of what happens to a lot of wrestling stars when they retire and you know they end up often in, in quite difficult circumstances so um, I think that's a hard thing I mean there's certainly I think this happens with other sports as well but there's the the kind of ethical dimension of being a wrestling fan, which, um, you know, when you're watching stuff and you're watching, as, as, as we, we talked about right at the beginning in terms of like, you know, the physical toll that it's taking on the people. And then you realize the conditions that they're working in. And then you think, especially when you watch like the eighties matches about the, the kind of the drugs and alcohol addictions that many of them had in order to do this. And, um, and it, it is, um, you know, it's a bit hard to think when it was not long after Chris Benoit, the, the wrestler, he, um, he committed a murder-suicide. He killed his wife and his son um, and then killed himself. And it was a big news story. And this kind of brought a lot of these issues of wrestler, wrestler health to the fore. And Bret Hart kind of was interviewed afterwards and he talked about Vince McMahon's big business practices. And he said he kind of, they kind of treated wrestlers like circus animals. Right. And there is there's a certain element of that when you're watching some of this stuff, especially the older stuff, is it? There is an element of it feeling, it's hard to watch sometimes, especially if you're watching Chris Benoit getting hit over the head with a steel chair and then you know what happens later. Um, 
and I think that's still it's the same with a lot of sports as well like people often talk about that with like you know football and head injuries and concussions and things like that it's as a viewer it's kind of difficult to know like can I take enjoyment in this especially some of the more captivating stuff from the times that we were talking about before in the 90s um you know the wrestlers were not very well protected <laughs> in and by any means by their employers at the time so yeah you do see like i mean if you think about the mick foley for example getting thrown off the hell in the cell yeah. <laughs> or, <laughs> or um you know getting hit in the head like multiple times by the rock when he's handcuffed right those are very influential moments and were captivating but they're also like you watch them now and it's it's hard to watch and you kind of feel a bit, you know, it's definitely, it's, you know, there's definitely a difficulty in being a wrestling fan that in terms of the, the moral dimension of participating in a, in an industry that does seem to take advantage of people to that extent. Um, so I think sometimes it's hard to really square that with the enjoyment that you get out of it. Um, they don't have uh, the rights even to their own wrestling names, right? Some of them, I think, don't. Like Hogan, obviously, does. I mean, that's never... Or The Rock, like, they definitely do. But, uh, yeah, the others, a lot of them don't. Yeah, for, for instance, uh, like, uh, John Moxley, who went to AEW, uh, yeah. he was Dean Ambrose. Uh, oh, yeah. did you know one of the worst... And to me, this was, like, the dumbest things ever. So, did you actually know that, you know, so like, Scott Hall was Razor Ramon? So, yeah. when he went to WCW, they actually sued WCW. And not because he used the name Razor Ramon, because he didn't. He was Scott Hall. But because his character resembled the likeness of Razor wow. Ramon. So, that's how petty these people are. So, forget about even the names. Like, the names are just one aspect of it. They won't even allow you to do things like, you know, whatever he was doing at the time. He'd be like, like, Chico. Or he would have the toothpick. They're like, yeah, Scott Hall can't do any of that. That's all trademark. And it's like, but dude, he's not Razor Ramon. It's like, no, no, no. It's too similar. And I think they also did this with um, the wrestler Earthquake. So WCW had this pattern of like turning um, WWF wrestlers into like WCW version wrestlers. So like Earthquake became Avalanche, right? And so Vince was like, nope, that's too close. You can't do that. And um, I think they did something with the wrestler Tugboat too. He also became something like some version of Tugboat in WCW. And they're like, yep, we're suing you guys too. You can't be anything close to Tugboat. So it's not only that they sued for the names, they actually even sued for the characters too. So petty. Right. It's like because the, the companies own like the characters, as it were. So they have the intellectual property over the characters. And then there's the wrestlers who portray the characters who kind of, you know, yeah, make their living portraying these characters, often created them, like, to, or, you know, they were, you know, had a significant role in the creative process of bringing the character to life. That's what's giving them their living. And then, you know, the company decides, oh, okay, we don't, we don't need you anymore, or, you know, we're not going to continue your contract. So, oh, so now you're free to go and work somewhere else, but by the way, you can't, <laughs> you can't take any of the stuff that's made you famous <laughs> that you could use to market yourself to other companies because we own that and we're just going to lock it away so that no one else can use it and make money off it. And I mean, I oh, like, unless you create fake diesel and razor Ramon. <laughs> <laughs> did you, do you remember that one? Oh yeah. So like when Nash and Hall went to WCW, Vince literally used their names and their gimmicks. And so he created fake diesel and fake razor Ramon. So wow. fake diesel was actually Kane. So the Glenn Jacobs, the guy who plays Kane, he was fake diesel. I don't remember the wrestler who was fake razor Ramon, but they pretty much, it was like a spoof and a parody. And like, they had a build up to it where like JR was like, Oh, you guys are going to get your heroes back next week. And then it's like, the music comes out. Everybody's like, wow. Oh my God. But no, that's not, it can't be. And then it's like, oh my God, it's Diesel and Razor. But it's not fucking Diesel and Razor of all. Then everybody's like, okay, this is stupid. It took like a minute, but everybody finally processed it. Like, no, they're just clowning on these two. And what was so funny, there was a story where um, Kevin Nash actually almost believed it. And he is Diesel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was this funny story where Nash was like, yo, so somebody gives me a call, like, uh, like my buddy, right? And he's like, hey, Kev, are you going back to the WWF? And he's like, no, why? And he's like, um, they're saying that Diesel is returning. And Nash is like, wait, what? Holy shit. Am I like, did I like miss something? And they're like, no, dude. Like, yeah, they're like, next week Diesel is going to be there. And Nash is like, I don't, how is that going to work? And they're like, nobody knows. So Nash is like, yo, on the Nitro, I'm actually sitting backstage and I'm like, yo, you guys have to put a raw. He's like, we have to see like what happens. And so he's sitting there and he's watching it. And then he's like, then as soon as I see the person come out, I'm like, 
Okay. I see what he's doing. This is so fucking stupid. He's like, I just turned it off and I go back to doing what I was doing. But he's like, yeah, man, even the WCW guys were gripped. He's like, most of the people in the locker room were like, go turn on Raw. We have to see what Vince is doing with these two characters. And then obviously it was a big letdown. But I mean, but the point was, I think the hype, it wasn't so much about the characters who were obviously always going to be a joke. Yeah. I mean, I think that case is really interesting as well. One reason I, I talk about it a bit more in, uh, in Philosophy of Smackdown in the chapter on identity because there's this question about like where is Razor Ramon <laughs> in like that time period in, in 96, right? Because, you know, so Scott Hall's gone to WCW um, and then like they bring in this new Razor Ramon in the WWF. But the fans, for the fans, like obviously, yeah, they're, they're fake Razor and fake Diesel. They're not the real ones. The real ones are in WCW. But then that's contrary to what, you know, the WWF is claiming in terms of the copyright issues. So there's, it's kind of an interesting situation about thinking about identity because it's particularly kind of like social identities and stuff because you have this mismatch between like, say, the institutional identity, which seems that they, those two characters are in the WWF, and then like the, the community or the fan views, which are, no, look, they're in WCW. Um, and you get these conflicting views about character identity and um, yeah, the connection between the, the the person playing the wrestler and the character, which are a lot, which are very tight in wrestling. I think a lot tighter than in other forms of entertainment sometimes where, you know, the characters sometimes are identified with the people to a larger extent and it makes it, that's why it's kind of so difficult to take them away from people when they want to move to a different company because it really feels like you're taking something away from that person. Um, and then, you know, the funny thing with that story as well is that when Scott Hall was inducted into the WWF Hall of Fame or WWE Hall of Fame a few years ago, they inducted him as Razor Ramon. Yeah. And then the story on the website about why he was inducted and stuff, it's like, well, Razor was a groundbreaking character in WCW where he... <laughs> Join the NWO and they referred to him as Razor Ramon during all the times that he was Scott Hall in WCW and they were explicitly stating at the time that he wasn't Razor Ramon because Razor Ramon was portrayed in the WWF by another wrestler, by Rick Bogner. So it was like, they just kind of like, you know, went back and just rewrote <laughs> everything that they had said before. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, that, that is a pretty crazy situation. Um, and it yeah, strong ties to identity, right? For, for instance, even even The Rock, uh, I I mean, sometimes I'll call him Dwayne Johnson, but even still, uh, I'll see him in the movie. I'll say, The Rock's in that movie, you know. Black Adam's coming out. The Rock's in there, you know. If I'm describing the movie to somebody, right? And and that that's that is interesting. That's fascinating. That in your book, you you make the tie to identity and how that relates to to uh, to wrestling and marketing and, and well, marketing as well. Uh, but it's true. It, it does put when you see that person. It does put in your mind that that's that character, right? And it's fascinating. I'm sorry. What, what were you going to say? No. So, so and the interesting thing was about Scott Hall. He actually was the one who created the Razor Ramon character. So yeah, that's the funniest part. So the, the story was essentially like whenever when they met. I think he was um. What was his name in WCW? It was like uh, Diamond Stud or something. So he went and he had a meeting with Vince and he comes in. He's like, yeah, I actually had the whole spiel, right? He comes in and he's like, hey, what's up, Chico? And Vince is like, what? And he's like, hey, man. He's like, I could be whatever you want me to be, man. But he's like, you know, today I'm the bad guy. And Vince is like, what the hell is this guy doing? And then like they finally start talking about it. He's like, Vince, have you seen Scarface? And Vince is like, no, what's Scarface? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so he had to explain it to him. He's like, yeah, man. So he's like, what I'm thinking is of like the Scarface character, the bad guy. So I don't know if he came up with the name per se, but the character was definitely Scott Hall's idea because Vince didn't even know who the hell Scarface was at the time. That's funny. And then they wanted the trademark rights to the character. So it's like, my thinking is like the name, Fine, you can keep the name. I'm sure Vince probably or his team or whomever came up with the name. But like to say, hey, you can't be like the bad guy in WCW, that's fucked up because that wasn't Vince. That was actually Scott Hall's character from the get-go. But I mean, I guess that's how copyright laws work. I think that's what WCW tried to claim as well, is that like the elements that he was portraying of the character were there before Razor Ramon. So like with the Diamond Stud stuff, he like dressed similarly and did all this similar stuff. But um, they ended up losing, yeah, WWF won that lawsuit, I think, so they, they yeah. couldn't win. Oh, and what made them look so stupid was literally they, because they won the lawsuit. Scott Hall's character changed overnight. 
he literally the next week went from like, hey, Chico, to, hey, yo, I'm Scott Hall now. And it was like, I'm sure to the fans, they were probably thinking like, wait, what? How, how does he not have the accent anymore? It just doesn't make any sense. So it's like literally overnight he had to change because there was nothing they could do about it. And it was so different from like, I don't know, let's say somebody like Earthquake or I guess now Avalanche becoming another name because you're just changing the name. Scott Hall literally lost an accent overnight. <laughs> yeah, so it made them look super stupid, which I'm prob- I'm pretty sure that's what Vince was going for anyway. I'm pretty sure he tried to make them look stupid. So, I mean, he pretty much got his wish. And so, Doug, I also wanted to ask you, what did you think of the Dark Side of the Ring series? Um, yeah, I've enjoyed them. I haven't seen all of them. Um, I think um, the ones that I've watched, I thought were good, yeah. Um, I thought the Montreal Screwjob one was interesting, although, yeah, I tend to, as with all these things, to throw up more questions than answers, but I guess that's what's so fun about these sorts of things. Um, um, I was trying to, but yeah, I, I, thought, I thought they were good. The last ones, I think I watched the Chris Benoit one and the Owen Hart one, which were both really hard to watch because they're such yeah. bad stories. Uh, in fact, it- and the best story I think about Owen Hart was that, um, so like, you know what happened to Owen Hart, right? Or no? Oh, so he actually like died in the ring. So he like felt, so he had, um, they had him like um, hoisted up and he was supposed to have like come down, like, like what Shawn Michaels and like other people were doing at the time, like they would come down like through the rope. So or with the rope. And then, so what happened was like the, um, the hook ended up accidentally unhooking and he actually fell into the ring and died. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what was so cool about it, I mean, whatever, I guess if anything is cool about it, was when Owen Hart was falling, he actually told like the referee, get out the way. Wow. What a human being. Like what a story that was. Like, it, like this guy literally probably knew that he was going to die. And the thing that he yells is get out of the way to save him. Yeah. 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 yeah no, it's, and yeah, it's very sad. Um, um, I'm just trying to think of the other ones that I've watched. In that series, I watched the the one about Randy Savage and Elizabeth, which I thought was quite interesting. That was a good one too. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and what's interesting is about the show itself. It's like, it seems like going back to that idea of like knowing what's going on behind the scenes. That's what, that's, I think, the selling point of it. Like people really want to know what it was like during those times, especially the 80s where pretty much nobody knew what was going on. They wanted to know what these relationships were like. And I mean, oh, and what's really interesting, I think, is the Randy Savage-Elizabeth relationship because Randy Savage was just as nutty as he was in front of the camera. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think that's the thing as well, like going back to the, the character wrestler distinction. I think there's a lot of, especially like, yeah, maybe in the 80s and even I think probably running through, there are some cases where the, the gap just doesn't really seem to be there. <laughs> so like Randy Savage seems like, yeah, people, were, he was just as, yeah, just as crazy in real life as he was in the ring or on promos. And, um, you know, I think you, you sometimes get that, that kind of thought. And people talk about Ric Flair this way as well. There was a, I think it was the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary about him, which, which I thought was kind of interesting because there he kind of talks about, you know, how he became this character, Ric Flair, which is similar to his real name, but slightly different. And then he kind of says, you know, I don't the, I think Shawn Michaels is interviewed and he's like, I don't think Rick has ever taken the time to know who like Richard Fleer, his real name is like, and Ric Flair's like, yeah, that, that's just a guy who got through a year of college. And then after that, it was just, the nature, like, you know, the nature boy character that he had. And um, I think like that idea, I, this is another, I also talk about this in the identity chapter of the book, like of, so there's different ways of looking at the relationship between character and, um, and the person. Like, so in these cases, it seems like there's, they, the people kind of become the characters as it were. And then they, I, I, because especially, you know, for a long time, people had to live outside the ring the same way that they did on the shows. It was like the, um, like the Sandman story, right? <laughs> you had to kind of, you couldn't, you had to be your character when you were around other people. Like if you were a bad guy, you had to be mean to people <laughs> if they asked for your autograph and you couldn't hang out with the, with the people you were feuding with or anything like that. So people had to really almost kind of live the, the gimmicks, live the characters. And, um, and then, it, you know, if you think about people doing that for 10, 15, 20 years, it's, it has to have like some impact on their their kind of real quote unquote personality outside of the ring and again that seems to be something very specific to wrestling i mean you have method acting in movies and stuff but that's usually for a fixed period of time like someone like daniel day lewis doing a movie year these stories about him but um but with wrestling it's like it's it's all the time for for an awful long period of time and you, you do wonder as well like how that affects the people who are 
portraying the characters, their relationships with other people as well. And it seems to be something fairly unique in that respect, which is also, it also makes it so fascinating to think about all these issues of identity and stuff within, within that context. And I mean, I th also what I think is super interesting is that for a lot of these people, I think they live the dream that most of us want to live. So when it comes to identity, I think that most of us sort of struggle with identity in the sense of like, we know that there's sort of social norms and for the most part, like we like social norms, obviously. I mean, they make us feel safe. We agree with them, right? We internalize them. But I think there's also this part of us that says like, I actually wish I could sort of go outside of that norm, right? So Stone Cold Steve Austin is a great example, right? It's sort of like your kind of average worker saying, I want to tell my boss sometimes to go fuck himself. Why? Am I not allowed to do that? Sometimes my boss really does mistreat me, you know? Sometimes I come in and I'm, you know, late five minutes or whatever it is. And let's say I'm late because, you know, it was hard to get the kid out of the house. It was hard to get them to school. You know, um, my wife may be sick or whatever it is. And then my boss comes in and starts yelling at me and talks to me about productivity and how they're losing money and all of this stuff. No empathy whatsoever. And yes, yeah, sometimes I want to be able to come out of character out of, you know, sort of the good worker be and say, yo, go fuck yourself. I was late for legitimate reasons. And so what I think a lot of the times is that like when you guys, let's say with Stone Cold, with Ric Flair, which definitely with Shawn Michaels. I think these guys are like living out personality types or let's say aspects of personality types that they actually wanted to be. I think these people kind of like all of us, we also, we have like this innate desire to not necessarily be over the top, but to be sort of, um, I guess, more authentic than society allows us to be. So for a lot of these characters, right, Ric Flair really did want to become Ric Flair. I mean, maybe somewhere down the line, he was like, okay, I got to kind of scale it back a bit and maybe this is not like the healthiest thing to do all the time. But I think for a lot of these people, I think for them in terms of identity, like it really gives them an outlet that real life would have never given them. Mm. I definitely agree with that. I would just imagine that um, trying to stay congruent to a, like a, a wrestler identity, especially if you had to be mean to people all the time, if that's what your character is, that's got to be very mentally fatiguing. And right. I mean, essentially, are, are you actually your character? Essentially, no, right? But um, the trials or the challenges rather that wrestlers uh, faced were, well, you can't put down this act, right? Because you need other people. I mean, it, it's part of the whole performance, right? They actually think that's who you are. So you have to stay congruent to that. Right. In a sense, that kind of mimics our real lives as well. I mean, we try to stay congruent to the identities that uh, people sort of um, Perceive. carve out for yeah. us. Mm -hmm. I could, we, should, we could say it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's also very mentally fatiguing, even just for a regular person. Um, so to be able to deviate out of that, or rather to just be, or to be authentic, um, is probably a lesson, you know, something that you'd want to take out from that. What's so cool about what you just said is yeah. there's actually a counter to that. And so because I think that it's so hard for people to be that, like, let's say to be that congruent, that's where I think the three faces of Foley characters came out of. So mm -hmm. Mick Foley was Dude Love, Cactus Jack, and Mankind. So the idea was that you actually, like, in, I, my understanding of it at least, is that in reality, you actually can't be congruent. And in reality, there are these different sides of you that it's like um, you kind of suppress them right mm -hmm. so it's like when you're dude love right you suppress like mankind then you suppress cactus jack when you're cactus jack you suppress those two when you're mankind you suppress those two but the idea was that because we're such sort of like intricate and complex creatures that we actually can't always be congruent and that's what i think the three phases of foley came from like it came from his idea that yeah sometimes i feel like i'm a ladies man sometimes i feel like you know i'm kind of masochistic with the mankind character and sometimes i'm sadistic with the cactus jack character mm -hmm. right but i'm never sort of one person all the time it just i don't think that that's possible or at least that's what i think his idea was no i agree with that, that that's I, that's why i like having this kind of discourse it lets you kind of suss out that kind of information as well yeah yeah I mean, one thing that just yeah thinking about what you guys were just saying is that so a lot is made of you know wrestling being scripted right and sometimes that's seen as like a detrimental aspect of it but it just occurred to me that you know one thing that really makes for success in wrestling and what what we find interesting about the characters is the breaking of scripts in a sense like breaking of the social scripts like the character of Austin you know not not doing the sorts of things that you're supposed to do when you're talking to your boss like the things that we all kind of think to ourselves like I really wish I could break the script of being like okay okay sir like of course I'm sorry sort of thing or you know Shawn Michaels as well people who are kind of doing these sorts of 
kind of transgressive things that, you know, which do break the regular norms that we experience in an everyday life. And that allows us to kind of almost live vicariously through them. I think that's what we find so captivating about those characters. Like, well, Austin's my hero because he's actually doing the stuff that I'm thinking all the time. And it, it, yeah, it does seem that there's that, there's that interesting duality where it seems like, yeah, well, of course, wrestling is, is scripted and that's what a lot of people say, well, look, it's not a real sport or it's not all this stuff. But really what hooks a lot of people into wrestling is, is, the, is the breaking of the normal scripts that we kind of are bound by. And, um, and I think that, that, still, that, that still kind of holds even with wrestling today, that, you know, the, the interesting characters are the ones who are doing things that we might want to do, but we can't, or we, you know, we're unable to, um, but there's still people who kind of, you know, they are it's still embodying that sort of ability to do some do things that we can't um, for various reasons. Um, yeah. Yeah, man, such a, I, such a, <laughs> what a show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy that we had you on, Doug. This was like really cool. So Alan, before we go, final questions, man? Uh, yes. Um, one, uh, where could we find your new book? Um, yeah, so my new book is called Philosophy Smackdown. Um, you can find it on Amazon or any regular bookshop. Um, it's also at uh, the publisher's Polity Books. So I think it's like, if you go to polity.co.uk, you find it there. Um, I also have a website for the book, which is just philosophysmackdown.com. So if you can find out, I have a blog, which, which I was using to kind of talk about stuff about wrestling that happened since, the book, since I wrote the book, which the pandemic has slowed down my productivity on that blog, but there's some, some posts on that. But yeah, so you can find more info about the book and links to buy it at philosophysmackdown.com, um, take you to the publisher's page and various things like that. Yeah. And where, where can we find you on social media? Um, so I'm on Twitter at Philo Smackdown. And uh, yeah, my website, philosophysmackdown.com, um, where you can find yeah, all sorts of stuff about me and the book and my other philosophy work and things like that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Doug. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk to you soon, man. All right. Bye. That was awesome. Yeah, that was one of the funnest shows we've done. Mm-hmm. Well, so if you want to follow us, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram, and at Seize underscore podcast on Twitter. Like, subscribe, hit the hit bell. The bell. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll be notified of uh, upcoming guests, being able to know uh, what's coming up, our plans for the future. And also, you could follow us on O4L online. Yes, at the O4L online network.com under the STM podcast section. And then also be sure to follow our guy, Vegas Media Designs, who takes care of all of our artwork on Instagram. Follow Andy O4L on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Check out his new, really, really dope podcast. It's called Heart of an Outlaw. He just had Tupac impersonator Richard Garcia on. All right, guys. Thanks again for watching and see you next time.